Today's lesson in Unit 2, The Savior We Need, in our Going On to Maturity series is Lesson 8, Jesus, Our Redeemer. In our lesson today, we will look at two questions. What was the cost of our redemption? And from what did Jesus redeem us? First of all, what was the cost of our redemption? Page 161 in the Catechism, question 185. What is Christ's work called by which he ransomed us from the slavery of sin, death, and the devil? Passage 880, Hebrews 9, verse 15. He has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. There is a price to pay to deliver someone from slavery. Jesus paid the ransom necessary to free us from slavery, slavery to sin, death, and the devil. Hebrews 9, verse 12, passage 881. He entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. This shows the way he did it. It was to serve as our high priest and enter the most holy place of heaven to sacrifice himself. Literally, redeem means to pay the price to get someone out of slavery. Page 160, question 184. Why are we all lost and condemned creatures by nature? Remember what happened after the fall? Before the fall, we were very good. We were created in the image of God. We were holy and sinless. We were in harmony with God. That was what Adam and Eve were like before the fall happened. Romans 7, verse 18, passage 874. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. This is a good reminder for the old sinful self. We need to continuously remind ourselves that, as far as our sinful nature is concerned, there is nothing good about us. But after the fall, human beings are, by nature, totally corrupt. Romans 3, 22 and 23, passage 875 there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This sinful condition exists for every human being. Not one of us is any different than anyone else according to our nature. This means that the image of God is lost. Remember that the image of God is perfection, but after Adam and Eve fell into sin, every single human being has sinned. Ephesians 2, verse 1, passage 876, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. That condition of sin is as final as death. There is nothing the dead can do for themselves. Because of your sinful nature, by yourself you can do nothing to change your natural condition. After the fall, every human being has been born a sinner. Romans 8, verses 6 and 8. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Being hostile to someone means that you are enemies. The sinful human nature that is born inside every one of us is hostile to God. Rather than being in harmony with God, we are God's enemies by nature. Let's take a look at what happened in the Old Testament ritual of redemption. Leviticus 4 gives us an overview of the sin offering the people were to bring to the temple. Beginning in verse 34, we see, Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger, and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. In this way the priest will make atonement for him, for the sin he has committed, and he will be forgiven. 
Blood had to be sprinkled on the altar and poured out at the base of the altar whenever an offering for sin was made at the temple. Leviticus 17, verses 10 and 11, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. The point of many of these sacrifices emphasized to the people that sin is serious. Sin demands a life as payment for those sins. When we consider how many times we sin, many lives would be necessary to pay for our sins. That's just what the people saw as sacrifices had to be made for their sins again and again. The lives of many animals were necessary to appease God for their sins. The Old Testament ritual of redemption meant that there was a bloody sacrifice. Really, however, these sacrifices just pointed ahead to the real sacrifice that was necessary. Question 186, page 161. What ransom price did God require Christ to pay in order to redeem us from this slavery? Matthew 20, verse 28, passage 886. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The real ransom for sin was not the lives of bulls and lambs. It was not the blood of animals that really covered the sins of the people. The blood of those animals merely pointed ahead to the real cost, which was much, much higher than all the lives of the animals that had been sacrificed. Ephesians 1 verse 7, passage 884, We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus paid both with his life and his blood poured out for us. The New Testament fulfillment of the Old Testament ritual of bloody sacrifice was the blood of Jesus, poured out as the real price for our redemption. The blood of Jesus included the physical suffering that he endured. This was a consequence of sin. His physical death was also part of the consequences of sin. The hell he suffered there on the cross again was part of the consequences of sin. He did all this to be our substitute, to pay for sin for us. Pages 161 and 162, question 186, why do we call Christ's blood holy? Passage 887, 1 John 1, verse 7, The blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sins. If the blood of Jesus is enough to purify or cleanse all people from sin, when the blood of many animals couldn't accomplish the mission, Jesus' blood is worth far more than the blood of many animals. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19, passage 888, you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus had no blemish, not one spot of sin marred his life. That is another thing that makes his blood so holy. The blood of Jesus is holy because Jesus is God's perfect Son. Page 162, question 188, why do we call Christ's blood precious? Passage 889, Psalm 49, verses 7 and 8, No man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough. Again, the psalmist reminds us of the ransom for sin. There was a high price to be paid. The fact that Jesus' blood was enough to make that payment shows just how valuable his blood is. Passage 891, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. You know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. 
Gold and silver are considered precious metals. Many people like to have them as part of their assets, the things in their lives that have value. Jesus' blood is worth more than any amount of silver or gold you could have in the safe in your house. So we see that the blood of Jesus is precious. It is worth more than the whole world. Page 162, question 189, why do we call Christ's suffering and death innocent? Passage 892, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God regarded Jesus as sin in our place. Passage 891, Hebrews 4, verse 15, We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Even though he was tempted to sin in every way conceivable to human beings, Jesus never succumbed to temptation. Never once did he fall. Passage 894, Hebrews 7, 26 and 27, such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Because he had no sin, Jesus could serve as the ultimate high priest in making his sacrifices for the sins of the people. As the sinless one, he didn't have to sacrifice first for himself. Instead, his sacrifice was sufficient for all of us. We see that the death of Jesus was innocent, paying for our sins, not for his own. We see in all these things the substitution in our Savior's act of redemption on our behalf. We go on now to the second question. From what did Jesus redeem us? Page 160 to 161, question 184. Why are we all lost and condemned creatures by nature? Passage 877, John 8. 34. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Sin isn't something you can choose to completely eliminate from your life. It owns you. It makes you helpless, like a slave. So we have a definition. Slavery means someone owns or controls another person. Jesus redeems us from a slavery to sin. John 5, verses 28 and 29. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. When you see the evil that is always evident in your life, you realize you have a problem. At the end of days, those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Your conscience rightly realizes you are one who has done evil in the sight of God. Our slavery to sin shows us that we are guilty and we deserve to be punished. Ephesians 2 verse 3 all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. The sinful nature craves sin. It can't escape the desire to chase after sin. It permeates your entire being. Our slavery to sin shows that we are corrupted and we only want to sin. Page 164, question 190, in what sense did Christ's redemption free us from the slavery of sin? Passage 896, John 834, everyone who sins is a slave to sin, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Earlier we saw the problem of slavery to sin, now we see that we are free by the Son. 
You know who the Son is. It is Jesus. Passage 898, Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The law is like a curse because you know you cannot escape its consequences. When you look at yourself in the mirror of God's law, you realize you deserve nothing but punishment. But Jesus became a curse for you to remove the problem of the law from you. Passage 899, Colossians 2, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. A dead person can't do anything for himself, but Jesus made you alive. He brought you back from spiritual death by forgiving your sins. We see in all of this that Jesus redeemed us from the guilt and punishment we deserve. Continuing our study of question 190, 1 John 1 verse 7, passage 897, the blood of Jesus his son purifies us from all sin. Because of Jesus' blood, your sin is removed. So we see that we are no longer corrupted and only one to sin. Jesus has redeemed us from this. Hebrews 2 verses 14 and 15 since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Not only are you a slave to sin after the fall, you are also a slave to death. Slavery to sin means that our souls will leave our bodies. Physical death is one of the results of the fall into sin. Page 164, question 191. In what sense did Christ's redemption free us from the slavery of death? Matthew 10, 28. Be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Physical death isn't the only problem as far as death is concerned. Dying in the condition of unredeemed sin would mean that both your soul and body would be subject to destruction. Slavery to death means we will spend eternity in hell. But, 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 57, passage 903, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus, death no longer has mastery. Jesus won the victory over death. Passage 904, John 11, 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Believers in Jesus have life because of his resurrection. 2 Timothy 1 verse 10, passage 905, Our Savior Christ Jesus has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Death is destroyed because of Jesus. Though physical death will come, even to believers, it no longer poses the same kind of destruction it once did. Because of Jesus, we are free from the ultimate result of the curse of death. Page 164 and 165, question 192. What assurance does Christ's redemption also give me about the end of my earthly life? Passage 910, Daniel 12, verse 2. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Though our bodies will decay in the ground, at Jesus' return on Judgment Day, all people will be raised from the dead. Those who are believers in Jesus will be raised to everlasting life. We see that we are no longer held in slavery to death. We will not spend eternity in hell. Page 165, question 193. In what sense did Christ's redemption free me from the slavery of the devil? 
passage 9, 15, Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11. The accuser of our brothers who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Slavery to the devil means that the devil accuses us of sin before God. Revelation 12, verse 9, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Satan's trickery is directed at every single man, woman, and child. He wants to lead all of us astray. The devil tempts us to sin and rebel. Genesis 3:15, passage 9:11. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Jesus was the promised one who was sent to crush the devil and his seeming power. Passage 9, 15, Revelation 12, 10, and 11. The accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. It is the blood of Jesus, the ultimate Lamb of God, which has paid the price needed to set us free from the devil's power. Passage 9, 16, Romans 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Jesus continues to intercede before the Heavenly Father, reminding our righteous God that he has paid the penalty for us. The devil can no longer accuse us of sin before God because of what Jesus has done. James 4, verse 7, passage 9, 14, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Jesus' blood and righteousness have paid the price. All we have to do is point the devil to the source of our salvation, and he has no recourse but to flee in defeat. 1 John 3, verse 8, passage 9, 12, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The work of Satan has been destroyed by Jesus. No longer can the devil tempt us to sin and rebel because Jesus has redeemed us from that. Ultimately, redeem means Jesus paid our ransom to set us free from death and hell. This ends Lesson 8. Jesus, our Redeemer, in Unit 2, the Savior we need in our Going On to Maturity series.